Good evening and welcome to the Daily News Roundup. I am Abigail Smythe. Coming up in tonight's newscast, Constable Noel Maitland, who is charged with murder, denied bail. Germantown residents who believe there are no targets for gunmen are appealing for increased police presence. 31-year-old chef pleads guilty to murder of 15-year-old girlfriend. JTA president says schools need divine intervention. Primary school student admitted to hospital after falling from second story of school building. First National Identification System Enrollment Center completed. In business, IMF urges policymakers to keep fighting against rising prices. In the region, the U.S. promises support for Haitian police as they battle armed gangs. Further overseas, another wave of COVID-19 brewing in Europe. And in sports, senior Reggae Girls head coach signs one-year contract with JFF. Now for the news in detail. Constable Noel Maitland, who is charged with the murder of his girlfriend, Donnelly Donaldson, has been denied bail. Maitland was denied bail when he appeared in the Home Circuit Court Thursday morning. His girlfriend was a 24-year-old social media influencer. He is also charged with preventing the lawful burial of a corpse. His attorney, Christopher Townsend, made the application on behalf of his client, who has been in custody since his arrest on August 2. The application was ruled on by Justice Vinet Graham Allen. The judge says there is substantial grounds for believing that if Maitland is released, he will fail to surrender to custody and will interfere with the course of justice. Donaldson was reportedly last seen at Maitland's New Kingston apartment and was reported missing on July 13. She has not been seen or heard from since. Following several searches of his apartment by scene of crime investigators, Maitland was charged with murder. Donaldson's relatives and well-wishers had strongly objected to Maitland being granted bail. Meanwhile, Donnelly's mother, Sophia Lug, has welcomed the decision in the Supreme Court to deny Constable Noel Maitland's bail application. Mrs. Lug, who was present in the Home Circuit Court, says she's confident justice was being done. Mrs. Lug says she simply wants to know the whereabouts of her daughter's body so she can have closure. A 31-year-old St. Andrew chef who pleaded guilty to the 2017 murder of his 15-year-old girlfriend in Seaview Gardens, St. Andrew, is to be sentenced on November 29. Amar Fairweather pleaded guilty under a plea deal to murder when he appeared in the Home Circuit Court on Wednesday, but pleaded not guilty to illegal possession of firearm and illegal possession of ammunition. Fairweather, who was captured in Clarendon in 2020, murdered Jose Marti Technical High School student Denise Hume at her home after she sent him a text message ending their relationship. About 3 p.m. on December 21, the teenager was at home with family members preparing for Christmas. Fairweather entered the yard and was seen going into Hume's cousin's room with a pistol. Shortly after, a loud explosion was heard. When family members rushed into the room, the girl was seen on the ground with blood running from her head and Fairweather standing over her with a gun in his hand. When asked why he killed her, he denied the allegation, stating that she had killed herself and that she was an idiot. He was then asked if she was dead and he replied, quote, she must dead, end quote. Fairweather then retrieved a spent casing, put it in his pocket and fled the area. The two St. Mary brothers accused of killing four people, including a Chinese couple, have their plea and case management hearing set for November 24. 
Nigel and Nicholas Walters were subsequently remanded when they appeared in the Home Circuit Court on Wednesday. Chinese business operators, 53-year-old Xiyun Shu and 48-year-old Hai Kang Wan, were shot and killed on December 23 last year during a robbery at their supermarket in Bellevue, St. Elizabeth. Three gunmen were reportedly caught on closed-circuit television footage posing as customers in the supermarket before the deadly attack. Investigations later led to the brothers being arrested and charged. The second incident involves 45-year-old businesswoman Sophia Brown and her customer, 58-year-old farmer Bernie Lewis, both of Long Hill District White House, Westmoreland. Miss Brown was at her wholesale on January 12 when the brothers allegedly entered posing as customers. Both women were reportedly assisting the men when they were shot and killed. Residents of Backwood in Germantown, St. James, are appealing to the police to increase their presence in the area. The residents say they are now targets for gunmen following a shooting incident on Sunday that left 21-year-old Gareth Leslie dead and four other men nursing gunshot wounds. Leslie and other community members, including children, were reportedly at a shop when a group of men drove up in a white Toyota Vitz motor car. Three men were said to have alighted from the vehicle and opened fire, hitting the deceased and four others before escaping in said vehicle. The police were summoned and the victims were rushed to hospital where Leslie was pronounced dead and the others treated and admitted. One resident recounts that since the start of the year, two of Leslie's relatives have been shot and killed by the same group of gunmen. The resident says on February 8, the gunman killed Leslie's cousin, Richard Plummer, in the community, and on September 5, another relative, Radson Foster, was murdered in Montego Bay. He adds that a young man, Adrian Sr., who witnessed Plummer's murder, was killed on March 16. The disgruntled residents of the small farming community say some of them are now unable to visit their farms and stay out late as they fear losing their lives. Community members say the men behind the killing hail from a neighboring community known as Sand Lane or Old Road. They also point out that the police have gotten reports from the community about the men. A grade 4 student of Winwood Road Primary School in Kingston has been admitted to hospital with serious injuries after falling from the second floor of a school building. Class teacher Courtney Edwards said the incident occurred during the lunch break while his student was walking to the talk shop with a group of other students. It is said that the boy was walking on the rail in an attempt to get ahead of the other students when he fell over. Mr. Edwards said the incident highlights the unexpected behavioral mishaps which can occur at schools. The teacher said staff and students who witnessed the incident are traumatized and emotional and have received counseling. Meanwhile, Principal Tanisha Pitters Montague noted that the Jamaica Fire Brigade will be called in to assist with reinforcing safety measures at the school. She also praised her teachers for their response in getting assistance for the injured child following the mishap. He remains in hospital in stable condition. In the meantime, Jamaica Teachers Association, JTA President Lasonja Harrison, says a divine intervention is needed in schools as there is an evil taking over. She laments that more prayer is needed. She is calling on righteous men and women of the clergy to partner with schools to offer spiritual support as administrators and teachers are burdened doing the best they can with the resources at their disposal. Two fatal stabbing incidents have been recorded in schools since the start of the year, the most recent being at the Kingston Technical High School last month when 17-year-old Michian Campbell was fatally stabbed by a schoolmate. In March, a 16-year-old student, Kamal Hall, of the William Nib Memorial High School in Trelawney was stabbed to death by his schoolmate during a fight over a guard ring. Several other bloody brawls have unfolded on school compounds since students returned to the classroom in March after a two-year absence due to the pandemic. Harrison says the recent flare-ups have left some teachers feeling unsafe.
She argues that teachers cannot be putting themselves at risk to break up fights between students at school when teachers have no insurance for injury on the job. She states that though the JTA provides counseling services and represents causes should educators sustain injuries in school conflicts, there are still challenges. She adds that the provision of allocation for metal detectors and in some cases surveillance devices is still not enough to reduce the challenges being faced by school administration and teachers. The JTA president believes a national campaign on family life, parent skills and the communal nurturing of children is needed urgently to tackle violence in schools. Additionally, she is calling for the guidance counselor ratio of schools to be moved to one for every 500 students, down from one to every 600 as negotiated by the JTA some five years ago. The major organized crime and anti-corruption agency MOCA has launched its first polygraph examiners or lie detector test course. The course is the first of its kind in the region and will facilitate the certification of eight new polygraph examiners from both local and regional law enforcement agencies. It will run until December 16 this year. National Security Minister Dr. Harris Chang says the government is marching forward in its bid to tackle corruption within its ministries, agencies and law enforcement bodies. He adds that integrity screenings or credibility assessments will therefore be an indispensable tool in the evaluation of future employees. Meanwhile, Director General of MOCA, Colonel Desmond Edwards, says participants are expected to complete 400 hours of work across 10 weeks of immersive training, which will be delivered by instructors from the Canadian Police College. MOCA's polygraph and vetting unit was established in 2014 and has conducted over 11,000 screenings. Currently, the unit conducts vetting services for potential recruits for the Jamaica Constabulary Force, the Passport Immigration and Citizenship Agency, Jamaica Customs Agency, as well as several ministries and government agencies. The service has also been extended to regional law enforcement partners, including the Royal St. Lucia Police Force, the Royal Montserrat Police Service, as well as police forces in Grenada, St. Kitts and Nevis, and the Turks and Caicos. The country's first National Identification System NIDS Enrollment Center is complete and is to be handed over this week. The center is located at the Central Sorting Office in Kingston and will be the first site to roll out the NIDS pilot program at the end of the year. Minister Without Portfolio in the office of the Prime Minister, Floyd Green, who has responsibility for NIDS, says contractors are already procured for four additional enrollment centres throughout Kingston and St. Andrew. And NIDS pre-enrollment software is also expected to be completed by the end of October to early November and will allow Jamaicans to log their information into the NIDS database and make an appointment to visit the enrollment site. Minister Green says members of the diaspora will be able to engage and register for a new identification card once they are a citizen of Jamaica or have been a resident for at least six months. He notes that a team from the Registrar General's Department, RGD, and the Passport Immigration and Citizenship Agency, PICA, has already engaged 500 Jamaicans living in the United Kingdom on matters such as birth certificates, among others. Minister Green says the build-out of a facility to digitize RGD's records from 1930 is 90% complete and is expected to be open in November. The full rollout of NIDS is expected to take place in the second quarter of 2023. NIDS is a unique, reliable and secure way of verifying an individual's identity. It will establish a reliable database of all Jamaican citizens and will involve the issuance of a unique, lifelong national identification number to every individual. And reggae singer-songwriter Marcia Griffiths has fallen victim to scamming as she was defrauded of almost $5 million. She is hoping ex-convict Ray Morgan will start making payments on Thursday. 
Morgan pleaded guilty to two counts of obtaining money by false pretenses in the Kingston and St. Andrew Parish Court on October 4 and also promised to repay the reggae veteran singer. The singer says she has little to no expectations but was hoping to get answers on what the ex-convict did with the money. It was reported that after their introduction last year, Morgan collected 30,000 US dollars and 250,000 Jamaican dollars from the singer as payment for a property that would be used to build a museum to preserve her legacy. Griffiths says the man was very convincing and had a sweet mouth. Following the transaction, she made several attempts to contact him but was unable to, which caused her to file a complaint to the police. The singer says the experience has taught her to be more vigilant. In business, the International Monetary Fund, IMF, has urged policymakers to keep up the fight against rising prices, even if it means more pain at a time of extraordinary economic turmoil. Managing Director Crystalline Georgieva warns that inflation is threatening to become a runaway train. Speaking on Thursday, she said the world economy has been hit by one shock after another with the coronavirus pandemic, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and a resurgence of inflation. She said, quote, If we do not restore price stability, we will undermine prospects for growth. We cannot possibly allow inflation to become a runaway train. Bad for growth, bad for people, bad especially for poor people, end quote. The Federal Reserve and other central banks have been raising interest rates to tame inflation. The managing director said many governments already heavily indebted after battling the pandemic should focus on helping the most vulnerable at a time of food shortages and punishingly high energy costs, not on broader spending programs. Her call for inflation vigilance comes at a time when some economists worry that central banks will overdo interest rate hikes and cause unnecessary economic pain. In the region, a non-profit organization is calling for the release of some inmates amid Haiti's rapid increase in cholera cases throughout the country's severely crowded prison system. There is also dwindling supplies of clean water. On Tuesday, the non-profit group Health Through Walls, which provides medical care to prisoners in Haiti, noted that not only inmates are at risk, but also security guards, kitchen workers and health staff. The call comes as Haiti remains largely paralyzed by gangs and anti-government protesters, leading to severe shortages of fuel, water and other basic supplies as the government calls for the immediate intervention of foreign troops. On the upside, on Wednesday, the United States said it will boost support for the Haitian police as they battle armed gangs and will speed up the delivery of aid. For over a month, Haitian gangs have prevented the distribution of diesel and gasoline, crippling businesses and hospitals, and creating shortages of basic goods including water. The State Department has created a new visa restriction policy targeting those who support the gangs and has sent a Coast Guard vessel to patrol Haitian waters. And on the international scene, the World Health Organization, WHO, and European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, ECDC, say they are seeing indicators suggesting another wave of COVID-19 infections on the continent. The WHO's region-wise data show that only Europe recorded a rise in COVID-19 cases in the week ending October 2, clocking an increase of 8% from the previous week. Public health experts have warned that vaccine fatigue and confusion over available vaccines will likely limit booster uptake in the region. Millions of people across Europe remain unvaccinated against COVID-19. The WHO and ECDC urged European countries to administer both flu and COVID-19 vaccines ahead of an expected surge in cases of seasonal influenza. And still on the international scene, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, is set to deliver counter-drone equipment to Ukraine. The alliance's Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, made the announcement on Thursday. 
It comes as Ukraine has asked its allies to supply it with more air defense systems and ammunition after Russia stepped up its use of kamikaze drones in its brutal assault against the country. The General Secretary said under this package, NATO will shortly deliver counter-drone equipment to Ukraine with hundreds of drone jammers which can help render Russian and Iranian-made drones ineffective and help to protect Ukrainian people and critical infrastructure. And in sports, head of Jamaica's senior reggae girls team, Lorne Donaldson, has signed a one-year contract with the Jamaica Football Federation, JFF. He says he is happy to have stability with the national team. The period runs from September 2022 to September 30, 2023, and takes into consideration the FIFA Women's World Cup next July and the Olympic qualifiers next September. Donaldson says the short-term contract is no hindrance to his plans. And in the meantime, the West Indies is preparing for Sunday night's first qualifier against Scotland in the ICC T20 World Cup. This after Wednesday morning's second warm-up match against the Netherlands was abandoned without a ball being bowled in Melbourne due to rain. On Monday, the Caribbean side had a 17-run win over the United Arab Emirates and along with the Scots, they oppose Zimbabwe and Ireland in Group B of the qualifiers. They must finish in the top two of the group in order to join the Super 12 stage. The Windies have struggled in the T20 format lately, having lost eight of their last 10 bilateral matches, including two against Australia earlier this month. And that's it for the news roundup for today. I'm Abigail Smythe. See you next time.